Hi and welcome everybody. This is Dragos from the Romanian Development Center. I'm with the MPD team within, uh, within that location. And for today, we're going to go going over a class, which we usually present at Masters, but you have the opportunity to see it online at your own uh, discretion. The class is called 246 RSV, and it's choosing the right serial bots for adding peripherals to your embedded control application. Now, during this class, we're going to be covering some aspects of uh, what serial buses mean, how can we use them, what are their advantages and disadvantages. And by the end of the class, we'll be able to do a couple of things. We'll be able to explain how the SPI, I2C, and UNIO buses work, what are their main pluses and minuses, their caveats, their advantages, and how we can use that to our own advantage. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to choose the optimal one by the end of the class for a specific application which um, will be done by doing a couple of exercises as we go. So this will be the class agenda. We'll be starting off with I2C. Then we're going to move on to SPI. And then we're going to go to the UNIO bus, which is one of our proprietary buses. To wrap it up, we're going to have an exercise. We'll be um, encouraged to, to think on our own, to, to evaluate whether or not we could employ one bus or the other for a specific given example as a use case for one of these serial buses. Now, without further ado, let's move in to the I2C bus. And this would be the block diagram for the I2C bus. And immediately we can see a couple of aspects that define it or give it some uh, its own special characteristics. And let's start by looking over at the lines, at the data and the clock lines, more specifically. So we have a data and a clock line. Having a clock line means that it's a synchronous bus. Data flows in synchronicity with the clock. It's supposed to go on certain edges of the clock. It's an only, uh, it has only two wires, so it's a fairly simple hardware implementation. There's not many, many wirings. It's not a wide bus, not many wires going around. Being a simple hardware uh, implementation of a bus, that means on the flip side, we're going to have some more stuff to, to do in software. So software tends to be a bit more complicated. We have to be more careful about how we construct the data to be pushed or pulled from the bus. What else? We can see that it's a master-slave architecture. So we have a master here, in this case an MCU, and a couple of slaves, an EEPROM and a temperature se sensor. So the master is the one that arbitrates and coordinates all the activity on the bus, and the slaves serve the master with data and um, so data as from an EEPROM or values for temperature as in the case for a temperature sensor. So it's a master-slave synchronous bus. If we take a closer look over on the right-hand corner, we can see that there are two pull-up resistors to VCC. So the default state of the bus, the default state of the voltage on the bus's uh, lines is high. They're being pulled towards VCC. That is a logical one, not a zero. This means that in order to drive the bus from one to zero, we're going to have to pull it down to ground. So this is why we, we named the bus an open drain bus. The devices on the bus have the capacity to pull by an open drain system the voltage level on the lines. Having uh, these uh, pull-up resistors impacts speed a little bit. So. Um, it's not a particularly fast bus, but it's not that slow either. It goes from 100 kilohertz to 1 megahertz. And in some implementation it can, implementations, it can go upwards to 5 megahertz. So it's not a fantastically fast bus, but it's still doing its job all right. Uh, it's fairly popular. It's got a lot of history behind it. It's been developed by Philips a number of years ago, 30 more years ago. It's very, very widespread in industry, so it's supported as well. All right. so. We have the building blocks of the I2C bus. We know that it's a master slave. We know there are some data lines. Let's try and see how we can actually use it to communicate, to deploy some, uh, some functionality. It's worth mentioning that every bus, regardless of implementation, be it I2C, SPI, UNIO, is designed to move data around. So this is what we're trying to do next. We're going to try and move some data. And we're going to see what are the building blocks that we need to employ before being able to do that. So we're going to start off with something that's called a start condition. And a start condition is required 
to signal to all the slaves on the bus that communication is about to happen. So this is what it does. And what it actually is, is the SDA line being pulled low while the clock is being held high. This is a start condition and it's all, always, always uh, done, by the, done by the master. It's enforced by the master. Afterwards, we're going to have to have a way to address multiple devices on the bus. And we're going to do that with a control byte. So the control byte is the first byte that's being sent after the start. And it's made up of, of multiple parts. And we're going to go into detail right now. So first off, there's the control code. So the control code, in this case 1010, defines the device type. In this case 1010 means that we're going to talk to an EEPROM. If there was another type of slave, it would have a different code. So we're being multiple slaves, we need a way to differentiate between slave families on the same bus. Then we're going to have a, some, something that's called a chip select sequence. So it's a, there are a number of bits, they're called chip select bits, and they address, they are used to distinguish between, the, between slaves from the same family of devices. So let's say, for instance, we have two EEPROMs on the bus, and those EEPROMs have their own dedicated address pins, which are tied to either VCC or ground, that form a combination. And these chip select bits are supposed to reflect the combination of addresses we selected in hardware using their dedicated pins. So to distingu distinguish between sorry, two EEPROMs on the same bus, from the same family, we're going to use the chip select bits, which are unique for each one. And last but certainly not least, we have the read-write bit. And this is kind of the most important bit in the whole ice crispy scenario. It's very important that we get how it works and what's, what exactly it means. So I want to tell you from the start, try not to latch onto the idea that the read-write bit defines read-write operations. But rather keep in mind that it means that it, it signifies, sorry, the direction in which data is flowing on the bus. So if we're going from the master towards the slave, we're going to have a write direction. If we're going from the slave towards the master, we're going to have the read direction. It's not necessarily a read or write operation per se, but we'll see how we're going to do that in a couple of minutes. So we started the bus, we send the, the, the start condition, we send the control byte, we know how to talk to a certain device on the bus, and now we're going to need a mechanism to control the flow of data and the correctness of the data on the bus. And that's why we're going to have an acknowledge. So an acknowledge indicates a successful data transmission. And it is the ninth bit or the first bit after an eight bit period on the bus. And it's always controlled by the receiver. So the receiving end controls the SDA line and gives or uh, gives, gives the ACK or gives the non-ACK, the non-acknowledge. In this case, the ACK is uh, the SDA being held low on the, on the ninth clock or on the first clock after eight consecutive clocks, which means that the successful transmission has elapsed. So we're, we're doing okay, we're in the clear. So it's the ninth rising clock, receiver end holds the SDA line low and is signals to the one that's uh, listening that everything is all right. If it were to release the line, if it were to, to not act, not pull the, the SDA line, the, the pull-up resistors will pull that line up and it will signal, signal a knack, a non-acknowledge. We're from memory, I'm from memory, we're doing buses. Let's see how we can actually use the accuracy bus to do an operation on an EEPROM in this case. And we're going to start with a write. So, First off, I usually ask my students in the class uh, if they can help out. Since you're taking this course online, you're not going to be able to. But try and picture what we went before, what we went over before, and see how that fits here. So we're going to need a start condition to start with, right? So the SDA line is being pulled low while the clock is being held high. Then we're going to send the control byte. We're talking to EEPROM, bear in mind, so the code is 1010. Its address pins have been all tied to ground. So we're going to send 000 for the code. And the read-write bit is set to 0. So the read-write bit, as you can see, is read slash non-write. So it's active 1 for read. It's active 0 for write. So we're trying to write in this case. We are writing as an operation, but we're actually writing in the way that data flows from the master towards the slave. The slave acknowledges, and then we're going to be in the clear. Now, we're trying to write to a memory. 
the next logical step would be to know where exactly we want to write to. So that means sending over an address byte. We're going to do that right now. Send eight bits of data. The slave, the EEPROM, acknowledges it. And we are good to go. Afterwards, we're ready to send the data to EEPROM, and the slave acknowledges again. Everything went smoothly. Everything went all right. Now, if we're done with that particular EEPROM and want to do something else with another slave or we want to do another operation with that EEPROM, we're going to need a way to stop the bus. We're going to need a way to reset the bus and make, make all the slaves available again, make them listen to another start condition. And we're going to do that by issuing a stop condition. So the stop condition is the SDA line being pulled up, being pulled high, when the clock is being held high. This is issued by the master. It signals to all the slaves that it's done its job with one slave and it's ready to move on. So SDA goes low to high while clock is being held high and this ends bus activity. I cannot stress this enough. So to go over it again, we have a start, a control byte, an address byte, a data byte, and a stop for a write operation to a serial EEPROM. We've written that data. We come back after an hour, we want to retrieve it, right? So we're going to do an EEPROM read operation this time. We're going to start with start condition. So there we go, SDA goes low while the clock is being held high. And then we're going to send a control byte for write. But we're doing a read. So this is where you have to pay a little bit more attention than usual. So we're trying to read. Why, why, why are we trying to, why are we, are we actually sending the control byte for write? So we can see the write bit, the read write bit is set to zero. It's active for write. Well, if we want to retrieve data from the EEPROM, we first off need to tell it where to read from. Where's the location I want to read from as a master? So that means sending it an address. So the EEPROM needs to know the address from which I want to read from, right? So the direction of the data on the bus is from the master of the slave. This is what I, what I asked you to, to remember, to keep in mind about the read-write bit. Data is flowing from the master to the slave. We're actually writing now. We're writing an address to the EEPROM. So we do that. It acknowledges everything's all right. And now we're going to need to read. But bear in mind, our bus was in a write state. So we need some sort of mechanism to reset that bus state, to make the direction change from the master slave to the slave master direction, right? So we're going to do that by doing a restart. And a restart is another start that happens without a stop being, being performed in beforehand, right? So we're going to pull the SDA line low while the clock is being held high. There, has, there have been no stops. We're just resetting the bus state. And now, since we were writing before, we're going to issue the control byte for read this time. So read write bit in the control byte is being set to one. We still have the, 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 the addressing as before. The device, the EEPROM in this case, acknowledges that. And it is ready to give us data. And now the master, after we receive the data, will acknowledge on its own. So Bear in mind directionality, bear in mind the read-write bit. Moving forward, as you could see before, we needed to send over four bytes or five bytes in account, multiple bytes of data in order to have just one byte retrieved from the EEPROM. So we had the start, we had a control byte, we had an address byte, we needed another control byte just to, to change directionality, and then we got our use usable data byte. So that means there's a lot of overhead just for one byte of data to be, to be retrieved from the EEPROM. And this is why we came up with this mechanism of acting. So in this case, when the master act to the EEPROM, it actually told it it wants to continue. It wants to get more data. And the EEPROM, when it gets the act, will automatically increment its internal pointers, its internal address pointer, and will give us, as the master, the consecutive data byte on that location. So if the master acts, acts, acts after each received byte, after the EEPROM has, has received its address and everything is going smoothly, it will still keep getting data from the EEPROM. The way to stop this is by issuing a NAC. So in this case, after two bytes of data have been transferred from the slave to the master, the master NACs 
releases the line that's being pulled up high, and the EEPROM knows to stop giving it data. In order to make the bus available again, we're going to uh, issue the stop condition, and everything will go back to normal. The bus will be idle. So one more time, ACK versus NAC. Master sends an ACK if another byte is requested, and master sends a NAC if transmission is over. So to sum it up, we've went through the bus characteristics, speed, block diagram, pull-ups, uh, how communication is actually performed, reading and writing. Let's, let's, uh, let's sum it up and wrap it up for the accuracy bus. So we know it's software focused. The hardware is very easy. There's a little bit more things going on, a lot more things going on in the in in software. So we have to be able to, to, to construct the control words, be careful who we're addressing, all sorts of stuff. It's pretty fast. Um, it's synchronous. So it, uh, it, it depends on the relationship between data and clock. It's open drain. It has pull-ups, right? Um, we mentioned that it's simple, only two wires. It has common hardware modules. They're spread out in all of all of the device families, all of the device families, and all of the microcontrollers and MCUs, and you can easily synthesize that into FPGA, no problem. It's very popular. It's scalable, and what I forgot to mention is that it's delayed tolerant. So as long as the relation, relationship between data and clock stays the same, you can actually stretch the clock and data periods, and everything will go smoothly. It will not latch onto data only in the uh, by itself, only when it's supposed to. So you can stretch it out. If you have an interrupt, you have to service that, go back to your communication, there's no problem. So let's move on to another type of bus. I presume nobody has questions online. So let's go to the SPI bus. Now, this would be the block diagram for the SPI bus, and immediately we can see that it's a bit more complex. There's a lot more stuff going on over here. There's many more wires. Um, it's, it's, it's like a mesh. So we can say it's a fairly complex implementation of a bus in hardware, which in turn means that in software is going to be a lot more easier to, to, to deploy and use. Uh, going to details, we still have a clock, so it's still a synchronous bus, but now we have dedicated data in and data out lines. So those are dubbed MOSI and MISO, master output slave input and master input slave output. It's still a master slave architecture, right? So we still have masters and a couple of slaves. But now, if you look in the bottom hand side of the, in the bottom side of the presentation, we have dedicated CS signals for each of the slaves on the bus. And these are chip select signals. So in order to talk to a device on the bus, a slave, a master will assert or deassert one of these lines accordingly, and uh, will be able to, to to talk with that particular slave. Uh, the bus has been developed by Motorola a couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago, like 30, 20 years ago. It's widespread. It's very fast. Uh, it goes upwards to 80 plus or 104 megahertz, and this is mostly due to the fact that it has no external components. So as you can see, no pull-ups, no pull-downs, no external resistors. Those do not limit the slew rates of the signals anymore. So we're pretty good on that, on that aspect. Uh, it's fast, it's widespread, uh, fairly complex in hardware. It, it has more wires to route. You need to take care of some signal integrity issues when you're going very, very fast, but those can be overcome. Um, what else? I think we just about covered the block diagram, right? Yeah, I think we did. All right, so let's see how exactly we're able to use this bus. Bear in mind, all buses accomplish transfer of data. They accomplish communication. Doesn't matter how they do it, they accomplish transfer of data. So let's transfer some data on the bus. And we're going to do that by doing an EEPROM read. So if we go back to, to the ice cream C, we're we remember that we had the start condition. We had a control byte. We had some addressing going on. So we're still going to need, in this case, the SPI, still going to need some way to start the bus and address devices. So let's start the bus. But how can we do that exactly? Well, we mentioned that we have a chip select signal for each device, each slave on the bus. We're going to start by deasserting that. So chip select, which is negated, so it's active low, will be pulled to zero. This signals to a particular device that's being 
uh, tied to that chip select that it's about to, 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 to serve its master. It's about to, become, to be talked to. We don't care about the clock line. We don't care about the MOSI or the MISO lines. So we've addressed, this is how we address a device, by its dedicated chip select line. Then we're going to tell it to do something. But since we don't have the, the simplicity of I2C devices, nor the read-write bit that sets uh, the directionality of the bus, we're going to issue a, an instruction. So in this case, SPI devices tend to have instruction sets. This is how you talk to an SPI device. We're going to issue a read instruction, which in this case is a hexadecimal free, or a decimal free, or a binary one one on the least significant bits of the instruction byte. The MISO line stays in high impedance, high Z, no problems. After it's received the read instruction, we're going to send an address to be able to do the read we've wanted to perform. Now, before we move on fo forward, there's something we need to take note of. It's not that important. You can read into it later if you want. There's no problem. SPI has four operating modes depending on the polarity and phase of the signals. So the default lane of the, the default state, sorry, of the lines is no longer up, high, pulled up. It can be either zero or one, low or high. So bear that in mind. We, can, we highlighted this over here. So the clock can start from high if, if need be. This improves compatibility, solves some other issues, but it's worth mentioning. No more pull-ups, speed, we're going fast. <laughs> No default state of the lines. Uh, not, not, not a, sorry, not a fixed default state of the lines. So, going back to the read operation, we're doing a read from the EEPROM. We've sent the read instruction, and now we're going to address within that EEPROM. And if you take a look at the slides over here, you'll see that I, I put up MSB of address words. So that stands for most significant byte of the address words. SPI devices, because we're going fast, tend to be bigger. They tend to have the capacity to serve all that speed, and the speed to serve all the ca that capacity, conversely, of course. So in this case, the EEPROM we're trying to read from needs two addressing bytes to be able to identify the byte we're trying to read from it. It has an addressing space which is wider, right? So we're going to start off by sending the most significant byte of the address word, and then we're going to send the least significant byte of the address word. So there's no longer 256 locations of memory to choose from. There's Twice uh, powered, <laughs> twice powered that much. Now, we've sent that, and then the device is going to respond, is going to give us the data we need from the EEPROM array. Whereas before, we used the stop condition to signal to all of the devices on the bus that communication with a certain slave has been elapsed. In this case, we're going to stop communication by asserting the chip select line, taking it high, it's no longer active, and we're going to be done with that particular slave. So everything went down pretty, pretty smoothly. Now, moving forward, it says here, example SQI operation SRAM read. So it's no longer SPI, but it's SQI. What's this SQI? What, what are we talking about? Well, in the industry, we felt the need to expand on the speed of the, of the SPI bus. And we could do this by two ways, either going upwards in in actual speed in, uh, in, uh, in clock rate, or by widening the lanes on which we communicate. So if you go really, really fast, over 100 megahertz, you're going to have some issues with signal integrity, parasitics, uh, all that sort of stuff that really hard to solve stuff when routing your, your signals. But instead, if you widen the lanes, the number of lanes, you widen the lane and the bandwidth by increasing the number of lanes you're talking on, you can accomplish the same thing at the same speed. So this is what we did. SQI stands for Serial Quad Interface. So it's no longer a MISO and MOSI line and a clock. We're going to be four I-O lines. So whereas before the lines were directional, we were duplexing, now we're really, really going du full duplex on four lines. So it's still a synchronous bus, it's still the SPI bus, but we're going to go four times wide. We're trying to read from an SRAM, in this case, not an EEPROM. We're going to start by deasserting chip select. The SRAM is going to pay attention to our command. We're going to send the instruction, probably the address, and then get the data byte we're trying to, 
to get. So we're going four times wider, right? We want to send an instruction byte. That's eight bits wide. How long do you figure it will take to send, how many clock cycles do you figure it will take to send that whole byte the, to the SRAM? Well, it will take only two clocks. So the read instruction has been rearranged on the SIO3 through zero li uh, lines to fit in only two clock cycles. It's still eight bits wide, so it's still zero, 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 one, one. It's still a three we're looking for, but now it's two clock cycles wide. Next up, we're going to send the address, the MS byte, same story, two clocks, it's still a byte, and the least significant byte, and then we're going to expect the data from the SRAM. Now, before expecting that, that particular data, we need to understand that we're actually talking to an SRAM de device at 80 megahertz, let's say. And that's quite fast. And we've also given it data, we've given it, we've given it three bytes of data in five clocks at that speed. So there are devices that tend to not support that stream of, uh, <laughs> of, of inputs, and they need a little time to process the information. So that's why we're introducing a dummy byte here. So the SRAM has been receiving the data. It's starting to, to, to move its inside, its internal logic to address within the, 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 the array, but it's not ready just yet. So we're going to need a dummy byte. We're going that fast. It's, bear in mind, it's still, it's still uh, two clock cycles. At that speed, it won't make any impact. It's only, uh, it's only for certain devices, so don't worry about it too much. So we're going to do a dummy byte here from the master to the slave. And then the EEPROM will, the, sorry, the SRAM will respond with the data byte. Once we've done with that, we can assert the chip select line and we're done with that communication. So to recap, we need only 10 clock cycles to get one byte of data. As before, if we needed to get consecutive, uh, sorry, consecutive uh, bytes of data from the, from the SRAM array, we could conversely give it more clocks from the master and it would still produce consecutive uh, bytes from those locations to avoid the already uh, <laughs> small overhead of six clock cycles, eight if you count the dummy byte. We've mentioned that SPI devices are a bit more complex, they're larger, they're faster, and this comes with the necessity to have instruction sets. So they were able to perform many more functions than a simple I2C EEPROM, which only stores and uh, gives us data. So in this case, this would be an instruction set for a serial EEPROM on SPI. So we have the read instruction, the read status register. It can perform two more functions with the status register, and it can also have write protection. So these are commands, instructions for the serial EEPROM. Other devices can be even more complex. They can have instructions which are parametric. So RCR, in this case for Ethernet control, will need, will start with three zeros and will need five bytes of variable um, instructions to, to uh, variable uh, values to read from a control register, let's say. All right, moving forward. It's worth mentioning that there is a bus called microwire. I'm not going to insist that much on this right now. It's very, very similar to SPI. The commands have a variable bit length. Um, the first bit after CS has been asserted is a start bit, and the commands are not always multiples of eight bits. So uh, we've kind of covered that. Um, there is some peculiarities of the, of, about the bus. If you want, you can certainly look into it uh, afterwards. We're not going to insist right now. So to wrap it up, SPI, it's more hardware focused. It's easier in software. You only need to give it some bytes in software and to know what to do with it. It's fairly widespread. MCUs have dedicated peripherals for, uh, for its uh, implementation. Um, it goes very fast. It's very popular. It's also delay tolerant. It's still a synchronous bus. What more can I say? It's uh, prone to some applications rather than others, but we'll see in the exercises at the end of the, uh, of the class. Moving forward, on the agenda here, 
we have the Unio bus. So this is one of our proprietary buses. Um, we've developed this a couple of years ago, and it has a very, very peculiar uh, functionality about it. It's very, very interesting. So let's move on. Yeah, this would be its block diagram. So immediately we can see that it's a fairly, fairly, fairly simple implementation in hardware. It only has one line of data and clock. One line, let, let, let's say one line for now. It's still a master slave architecture, so we're still a master coordinating all the transactions on the bus, but it's no longer synchronous, so there's no dedicated clock. Somehow, the clock and data have been combined into a single line. And you would imagine it will not go very, very fast. It goes from 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz. It's not super, super slow. The, its top end speed is the, at the beginning of the range of the I2C speeds, but um, it still performs nicely. And as you would imagine, it's being this simple in hardware, only one line, would mean that it's a bit more, or maybe not a bit, quite a lot more complicated in software. You've got to be careful when you're timing the whole transaction. You've got to be able to uh, manage your interrupts better, to not to interrupt the flow of the Unio communication if you're doing it. So uh, that's its main caveat, but it can be overcome as well. Bear in mind, the advantage is only one data line, only one wire to be routed on your, on your design. So, I'm going to switch up a bit to the other buses. Remember, we had either a start condition, either an assertion of the chip select uh, line. Now we're going to need to have some sort of mechanism to initiate the communication on the Unio bus as well. So, before doing that, uh, I uh, oh, okay. I would actually like to talk about <laughs> how we how we combine data and uh, sorry data and clock on the same line. So before doing that, we're going to reach that uh, pretty soon. Uh, before doing that, as, as, a, as a slight hiatus, we've been able to combine clock and data for this Unio bus using something that's called Manchester encoding. So we've defined bit periods of a certain fixed length, which are determined by the master, with transitions going on. In the, within those periods. So if I have four T periods over here, pictured in the, in the slide, a falling edge in this first one on the left top corner would indicate a zero. Conversely, over here, it's still a zero. So the, the, the SCI O line is falling from high to low. That's a zero. A rising edge would indicate a one in this case. So this is how we encode ones and zeros using a single line. But bear in mind, we had predetermined T periods with a, with a length, which is determined by a master. Now, let's say, for instance, we want to move three bits on this bus. And on the SCIO line, we we'll, would we'll have three T periods, three consecutive T E periods. And if we want a one, we're going to have the line go from low to high. If we have a zero, we're going to have the line go from high to low. And one more time for another zero, from high to low. If you've noticed on the slide, there have been transitions that do not count in this case. There have been transitions which were being disregarded. Why? When we want to send two consecutive zeros, we need to reset the SCLO line to high. We need to be able to uh, prepare our, our line to be able to do a high to low transition for the second zero. And this is what happens here. So this transition in this uh, red highlighted peri period over here is being disregarded. The slaves and the master, when communicating, will only check for transition in the green periods, in the middle of the TE periods of time predetermined by the master. So there's only certain windows of time in which transitions are regarded or disregarded. This is how we can actually send two consecutive uh, values of the same value, two consecutive bits of the same value. Moving forward, this is the part where I started off a bit in a hasty manner before. We need to start communicating on this bus. We have the mechanism to encode data on a single line. We have the mechanism to encode the clock on a single line. We need to start communicating with some slaves now, because that's what we do, right? We're a bus. We need to move data. So to start off, we're going to need a standby pulse. And this standby pulse 
is issued by the master and it places all the slaves in standby mode. So it's a logical one for a period of time greater than t standby times standby, which is in this case 600 microseconds. And it's required every time you either start your device, it has a power out reset, it has a brown out reset, some errors have occurred on the bus and you want to reset the states of all the slaves on the bus. It's required as well when switching between devices on the same bus. So it actually places everything into listening and standby mode. Then we're going to need a start header. So this start header initiates commands. And it's made out of two parts. First off, there's a low pulse. The low pulse after the standby pulse signals that other slaves on the, on, the, on the bus should listen to the next part, which is a sync byte. And the sync byte is very, very, very important. As you can see, it's an alternating pattern of zeros and ones. So it's a zero, one, zero, one. The edges are rising and falling. And it's actually a hexadecimal five. It could be an A, if you, if you wish. And this is used to determine the TE period, the clock rate for the rest of the communication. So slaves detect this master data rate which said before is between 10 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz, and will latch onto that T period. They will know that everything that's going to be sent on the bus from now on will have the fixed period of T. This way, they can listen to transitions in the middle of those periods and actually be able to decode the data. We had for I2C an acknowledge. We're going to need an acknowledge here as well because there's only one bus. We have to keep the control of the flow of data on the bus. There's only one line on the bus, sorry. So we defined an acknowledge sequence. And in this case, it's a bi-directional acknowledge sequence. We have a master acknowledge and a slave acknowledge. So we, we've dubbed those MAC and SAC. So the MAC is issued by the master. And, uh, and if, it's one, if it's a one, if it's a logical uh, one, it's transitioned towards high, it continues the command that's being uh, executed right now. If it's a zero, if it's a transition from high to low, it terminates command. Conversely, the slave acknowledge, sorry, if it's a one, it indicates no error. But if it stays in high Z, in high impedance, it indicates an error except for after the start header. And I'm going to take a moment here and actually explain why. So we have a bus with multiple slaves on it. The master tries to initiate communication with multiple slaves, with either of the multiple slaves. It issues a standby pulse, then a start header. Within that start header, it issues the information required by the slaves to decode the length of the TE period. So right now, everybody's listening. Well, in this case, there is no particular slave to actually respond, correct? All the slaves are listening. All the slaves are measuring the, the start header. And there's no one to actually send a positive a one a slave acknowledge. This is why uh, the no sack, the no slave acknowledge indicator error just except after start header. Now, we've determined the bus peri the, the, the TE period. We have the building blocks to, to go on. Then, if all of the devices have been listening, we're going to need a way to differentiate between those devices, those slaves. So we're going to send their address. The address is an eight bit wide uh, sequence of bits. And it will only target one particular slave at a time. The master wants to continue in this case. It sends the Mac. And then the slave, which has been addressed, uh, responds as well with a SAC. So it's an 8-bit value, the address for each slave, which is unique. If we want to do a read operation, same as with SPI, we're going to issue the read command. So um, it's still a free, which is pretty interesting. The device that has been addressed, that knows the, the rate at which the communication is going, will also know the command that it's supposed to perform. The master goes on. It sends a master of knowledge. The slave wants to go on. It has received the data correctly. And it's ready to produce some, some, some information. Since we're reading, we're going to need to know where we're reading from. So that means sending over an address. And even it's a, if it's a bit counterintuitive, there are devices on uh, Unio that have a larger addressing space. So in this case, we're going to send two uh, bytes for the address. We're going to send the MS byte and the least significant byte. 
master acknowledges every time, slave acknowledges every time, everything is going smoothly. It is only now that the slave is being, it has all the information to produce the data we've been looking for. So as you can tell, there's quite a lot of overhead when trying to get only one byte of data, which means that we have to have a mechanism that uh, <laughs> can actually expand on that. And same as before as with SPI and SQI, if we keep uh, giving it clocks, more importantly, if we send the master of knowledge in this case, the device or the slave will know to produce more bytes of data. This is done up until the, the master decides that, all right, I got my two bytes of data, that's all I wanted, so there's no need for any more bytes anymore. I'm going to send a no master of knowledge over here, and the slave will acknowledge that on its own, on its part, and the communication will be elapsed. It has been done. It's a bit more complicated. Bear in mind, only one line of uh, clock and data for the bus. Uh, we've encoded that using the Manchester encoding. The bus period is predetermined. It's measured by all the slaves. It can be retrieved if it skews over in, uh, by time. It can be actually reconstructed from the impulse that it gets from the master. It's the slaves can reconstruct the data rate from the master's inputs. So um, it's, pre it's, it's pretty reliable. To wrap it up, um, no more uh, synchronicity, no more clock, so it's a synchronous bus. It's fairly slow, but not all that slow. It's still 100 kilohertz, you can do some stuff with it. Um, what else? The, the, the bidirectional act is a feature of this bus, it's a curiosity of the bus, and it has part specific commands, and that's kind of about it, right? Yeah, that's about it. So, moving forward, we went through the I2C bus, we went through the SPI bus, we went through the UNIO bus. Let's move on to an exercise, and I will be narrating this because I don't have any more uh, input from you guys over there watching, but uh, you, can, you can extract the data from it. So it's supposed to be an exercise in which we are choosing a bus for a particular application. I mentioned that we'll be able to explain how SPI, I2C, and UNIO work we'll be able to see to pinpoint which are their pluses or minuses, and we'll be able to choose the right one for application, and we're going to do that right now. This, before going on, we can take a look at the slide uh, to, to, to establish that information well within your knowledge base. And let's see here. We have a scenario. We have a new project with an EEPROM, a temperature sensor, and a DigiPod. It's supposed to run at 400 kilohertz. Will we be using I2C or SPI? Well, you can think of it this way. So we have an EEPROM. We're probably not going to write all that much data to it. We have a temperature sensor. Temperature might not vary all that fast. It's still devices that are being measured or enclosures have thermal inertia. And we have a digital pot, which as well may vary uh, with, with, with time in a faster fashion but it's still not a, a, a DAC, right? So you could argue that we could go slower. We could go slower in the way that the, the environment is, evolved, is, uh, is moving, right? Conversely, we need 400 kilohertz. We know that that's the spec. So we could go a bit faster, maybe choose a, a, a more uh, capable bus. We don't know if that's a minimum or a maximum. We're going to work around it. Both buses have the capability of running at 400 kilohertz. And this is where, where I'm trying to get. It really goes down to your own personal preference, your own constraints, your own signal integrity issues, your own routing constraints on, for your board. Sorry. In this particular case, you can choose very well either, either bus. So if you want to have more control, less overhead, uh, you can go with SPI. If you want a simple hard implementation, uh, fair more complex software, you can go with I2C, no worries. In scenario two, we have a cartridge that's removable, and we want to store some data on the EEPROM of that cartridge. Are we going to use I2C, SPI, or UNIO? Bear in mind, the data is not that much. It's only a serial number. Well, this is one of my favorites. We could go easily with SPI, four wires, a ground, no problem. I2C as well. But think of it this way. 
wouldn't, we, wouldn't it be nice to have just two wires, a ground, and a data line running through a connector to a serial EEPROM that uses Unio? Maybe it would. If you can afford to go slower, in this case, I would go with the Unio. If you need a bit more speed, you can go with either I2C or SPI, but bear in mind having only two active, only one active wire and a ground for the, for the cartridge connector can lead to more reliability, can uh, avoid some, some problems with uh, manipulation of the cartridge, and so on and so forth. So once again, it still depends on you, but you know could be a choice here. For scenario three, we are revising a board. So we're already using an SPI SRAM and an I2C sensor. We want to add a temperature sensor. Will we be putting that extra sensor on the I2C bus or on the SPI bus? Well, let's see. It's a temperature sensor. It not, it's not as fast. It doesn't have to, to, sp to, to give us data all that, uh, all that fast, all that continuously, maybe. Uh, the environment in which is it, in which it is, uh, does not vary with uh, temperature all that much, or it could. Who knows? So what could we do here? Well, if we put it on an ice core C with the specialized sensor, you might argue that we're going to take away its bandwidth. The specialized sensor might suffer from that. It won't be able to talk all that uh, that readily with the MCU. If we put it on the SPI line it will interfere with the SRAM. But then again, SRAM is rather fast. You need to store data on it. The temperature sensor is slow. Hmm, who knows? Maybe in between periods when writing to SRAM or reading from SRAM, you can actually pull the, ten the sensor to, to get a temperature. Once again, either scenario is good, depends on your cost, depends on your uh, constraints. If you have a temp sensor, sensor that's, I don't know, more cost effective on I2C, go with that. If you need the extra speed or compatibility of the SPI, you might as well go with that. So there's no worries here. And for scenario four, and the last one, we have a data acquisition app with an SPI Ethernet controller and four eight-channel ADCs. It's supposed to run at one megahertz. What will we be using for the ADCs? Will we be going for I2C or SPI? Well, in this case, um, it's it's not a no-brainer, but since we need all that speed, one megahertz being at the top end of the I2C capabilities, uh, since it's an eight-channel eight channel ADC, which is actually a package with four ADCs on eight channels, you're going to be thinking at lots of data. So lots of data, you're going to be needing some more speed. All that being said, I, for one, would go for SPI over here. Even if it uh, kind of interacts with the internet controller, they might as well be able to split the line, uh, no problem. But you'll be able to get bursts from the ADCs in a much more reli reliable and fast fashion. And the internet control can wait for them, their, that uh, data, those datagrams, to be sent over and delayed, adding a bit more ping maybe to your application. So to wrap it up, we have went over I2C. SPI, UNIO, we've seen some examples. Hopefully that gives you some uh, more thinking room to, for your application. You have the choice. Um, the site will be available at microchip.com, this material as well. For any other inquiries, please visit microchip.com. We have uh, lots of training materials, lots of classes. We're working on that and expanding those every day and every hour. That being said, thank you for your time and good luck with your embedded control application.